according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24. Youth suicide is a growing health problem deserving of our attention and efforts to reduce its incidence and impact. In order to help young people that may be struggling with suicidality and self-injury, it is important that we increase awareness and education among a wide range of professionals and others who work or come into regular contact with young people. The former Surgeon General David Satcher said that it's the most preventable form of death in the U.S. today. and, and more recent Surgeon Generals have confirmed that thought. The reason why we believe that suicide is preventable is that we know that the majority of people who die by suicide have an underlying mental illness, about 90% is believed. Um, and those mental illnesses are treatable. And if we can get people the support and the treatment that they need, they don't have to suffer and they don't have to die. As an educator, you come into contact with youth on a daily basis and are uniquely positioned to observe and respond to student behaviors that could result in serious injury or death. In order to be able to respond, you need a basic understanding of the skills, vocabulary, and techniques to support young people at risk of suicide and self-injury and make the appropriate referral. This online training reaches those basics. Everyone has the strength to get through tough times. Some people just need help to get that strength out of them. This is why this online suicide prevention training is so important. We design specialized modules for frontline practitioners. Those nurses, counselors, youth leaders at youth serving agencies, first responders and others with special attention given to youth who are at elevated risk for suicide. Through this training, you will learn more about school's important and unique role in youth suicide prevention, as well as through practice scenarios, how to recognize risk factors, warning signs, and protective factors in young people that may be at risk for suicide. At its heart, the S word, the role of schools in preventing suicide, tells the story of how important it is to be able to recognize the signs that a young person is struggling with suicidality and be able to intercede and get them the help that they need. The stories told in the S word help make sense of the unimaginable and help us all explore different ways of doing, feeling, thinking, and behaving towards suicidal young people. Even though the S word may educate and inspire, these stories may be hard to see and listen to. It requires taking time to slow down and sit with sometimes upsetting confusing or painful emotions. For many people, suicide is hidden and rarely discussed in public. Many individuals do not recognize it as a significant public health issue. Suicide impacts communities, families, and individuals. Some of you have personally been impacted by suicide. Please remember it is a difficult and complex topic and is at times provocative or upsetting. The first order of business is seeing to your own emotional needs. Beware of your response to the speakers and the school-based scenarios. If you need to pause and take a break, please do so. Go for a walk, take time to breathe, the purpose of this training is to prepare educators to better support young people in schools who are hurting or suffering from issues that may lead to suicide. Through this training, you will gain skills that will help save a life. There are many voices within the suicide prevention field. Let's hear from a few of those voices now. 
Suicide prevention is extremely important to me, both in my role as an educator and also in my role as a parent. As an educator, I take very seriously that parents trust their child's well-being to us as educators to do the best we can to prepare them to have happy and successful lives. As a parent of three children, the youngest of which is a, is a gay male who attempted suicide as a sophomore in high school, I guess the work that I do in schools really um, took on a different meaning for me. As an administrator, I've always, and as a teacher, I've always worked as hard as I could to create for children an atmosphere that is welcoming, accepting, and supportive. To me, that's the most important thing. Everything else comes after we create that learning environment. All kids have to feel safe, welcome, and accepted. We want to help you prevent youth suicide. Many suicides can be prevented, but this requires attention and action. Silence is never the answer. Students are the most underutilized resource in schools for suicide prevention. School staff, we need your help and support. We are stronger when we work together to help each other. Hey, this is Reverend Liz Walker. Let's get our help with this. Did you know that social connectedness in school reduces the risk of adolescent suicide? Research confirms that when a child perceives an important adult cares about them, it significantly lowers the risk of suicide. This is good news. Caring adults who have contact with students who are at risk of suicide can save a life. In this module, you will meet individuals you can partner with to prevent youth suicide. Remember, there is a role for all of us in preventing youth suicides. Suicide prevention is everyone's business. Uh, my name's uh, Commissioner Joseph Conant from the Springfield Mass Fire Department. The subject of suicide awareness and prevention is very important to me because my father died by suicide. Going to suicide calls on the fire department is, is very high stress especially when there's children involved. Uh, back many years ago, we had a very high profile student suicide in Springfield. The child's name was Carl Walker Hoover, and he was 11 years old. I was the chief on duty that night, and one of my engine companies responded to that. And uh, I recently talked to one of the young men that was on that call, and he stated that in his time on the job, that was probably the toughest call he's ever been on. He, he said to me that the, on the way back from that call, it was the quietest he's ever heard inside of a truck. Nobody spoke, nobody talked. So they're very tough calls for firefighters to respond to. We'd like to see, see them end, so it, we don't have to respond to any of those calls ever again. When youth die by suicide, the impact of the death on parents, family members, friends, and the community is heightened. This is Michael's story. I lost my little brother Michael in April of 2010. He was 13 years old. I knew from Michael's best friend. He was being bullied in school to the point where on the day he died a couple kids followed him into a local record store and made threats. According to my mom, Michael was also struggling with his identity. He had come out as bisexual to her a few months prior, and he was terrified of what our family would think of him. I got the call on an otherwise eventless weeknight. It was my mom, and she was panicking because my brother was missing. I heard fear in her voice as she told me they'd had a fight the previous evening before he went off to his friend's house to sleep over. He should have been home hours ago. He wasn't answering his phone. I tried not to panic myself and suggested maybe he was just walking around town biding his time before he came home. After all, I'd done the same thing at his age. In the moment after I hung up with my mom, I realized my brother probably needed to talk to his big sister, so I tried to call him. It went straight to voicemail. An hour later, my mom called back. I knew right away that things were not okay. Her voice was flat and emotionless. I asked if Michael was all right. No, my mom said, he's dead. Those words, the worst two words I've ever heard, caused me to drop to the floor with the phone in my hand as a feeling of numbness spread over me. It was like my body knew it had to turn off anything resembling emotion in order to survive what was coming next. At some point, after learning Michael had died, my mom had tried to take her life too. 
In the morning, I called out of work indefinitely. My dad and I had to plan the funeral ourselves. It was surreal. We had to go to the funeral home, pick out a burial plot, pick out a casket. The funeral took place on a perfect spring day in May. My mom was still in the recovery unit. As the Reverend spoke in beautiful platitudes, I cried uncontrollably for the entire service, holding on tightly to my boyfriend's hand on one side and my dad's on the other. Why wasn't I there? I could have done something to help him. I was his sister. If only I'd known how bad things truly were for him. Risk factors for suicide are things that increase the probability or possibility that someone might struggle with suicidal thoughts or behaviors. So when we think about risk factors, there's some significant categories, and some of them I've mentioned, but things like psychosocial factors, like what's happening in the person's life. Have they had a significant loss? Have they experienced a traumatic event? Are they experiencing something that they're really struggling with that is impairing their ability to cope in some way? Are they struggling with a, a chronic medical condition that might cause them to be in chronic pain. Do they have access to lethal means? Now, this is a really important one that isn't always thought of easily, but access to means really can make a significant difference in whether someone lives or dies if they are struggling with suicidal thoughts and behaviors. The way someone thinks their cognitive style can make a difference. Are they a black and white thinker? Are they able to, to adjust? Are they the kind of student that says, if I don't pass this test, I'll die? So when we think about risk factors for suicide, we often talk about the two most prominent risk factors being a family history of suicide and previous suicide attempts. But there are a range of other risk factors that can contribute to increased risk. Things like medical disorders that are causing chronic pain, things like psychosocial factors, including being bullied or being a bully, history of trauma, things like clinical factors. Certainly the majority of people who die by suicide struggle with some underlying mental illness, most often depression, but there are many other illnesses that, that people struggle with as well, including eating disorders, including bipolar disorder, and a range of other disorders as well. One of the things that's really difficult about depression in particular is that not only is it itself a significant risk factor for suicide, but it also makes the likelihood of engaging in behaviors or things that, that are also risk factors increases. So the likelihood of someone engaging in isolating or engaging in non-suicidal self-injury increases when someone's struggling with depression. Depression is certainly a significant risk factor for suicide, all thoughts and behaviors, and it's important to know a little bit about what depression looks like. Depression doesn't always look like someone just being withdrawn or crying, and I think a lot of people believe that is, is what they're always going to see. Very often, depression looks like somatic complaints, stomach aches, headaches. There are a lot of different things that people might see that could be indicators that someone is, is dealing with depression. It's worth asking. They're not always, but if it's a significant change from someone's baseline from how they normally behave, it's worth looking into and, and trying to get some more information. And if they're showing warning signs specifically about suicide, thoughts, or behaviors, it's definitely worth asking. So when we think about warning signs, we think about indicators that something is going on for someone. So there are certainly warning signs that someone's struggling, whether it's depression or some other, other mental illness that might be happening for them. So if someone is writing about or drawing about or talking about death in any way, it's really an important thing to follow up and ask, what's going on? If someone is giving away possessions or talking about not being around for important events in the future, if they're putting their affairs in order, if they're saying goodbye, telling people how much they've meant to them, these are really important things to, to be aware of, to take notice of, and to respond to as soon as possible.
So for every risk factor that might exist for someone, there are an equal number and perhaps more protective factors. And for every student that may look different, but what are the things in their life that they have that are worth living for? And so really finding things that support that student, that make that student feel like they belong in some way, that they're connected in some way, and that they're supportive. We know that certainly having things that they identify as reasons for living, things that they're passionate about, that they can connect with are really important. Having connections with other people, having someone that they feel like they can talk to and confide in. We often hear from students that if they, if they had someone to talk to, that's all they're looking for, someone who could ask them if they're okay and really listen to the answer. My name is Sasha Restrepo. I graduated Newton South in 2014. Last year in Newton, we had three suicides occur. It shook me up very personally, and simply because I've had my own journey with struggling with mental illness in my family, with myself. Why I think it's so important is because I know that students every day go down the hallway dealing with problems you feel crappy and there's your math teacher talking to you about fractions and you're just like I could care less about what happened and how to do this I'm worried about what's going on but you you can't say I don't want to listen to you I'm worried about this you have to sit there and smile and, and, and try to understand whereas someone who has a cold and is sneezing or someone who has a cast and broke their arm last week will have an excuse and will speak up and say I want to go to the nurse's office or excuse me I don't feel well or will be excused and everyone's like, oh, I understand, she's sick, you know? But depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, these are all illnesses. It's not like a cold, but just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there, and it doesn't mean the person's not suffering. Almost like an onion, there are many layers of risk factors and warning signs that we must peel back in order to be able to better support young people struggling with suicidality. Tragedies. We really want everyone, not just young people, we want everyone to understand that there's never a single cause for suicide. It's complicated. It's a perfect storm if you will, of lots of tough things coming together. And as you've been hearing through this training, we, we really assume from the research what we know is about 90% of people who die of suicide have some underlying mental health challenge going on. And we want people to understand that, that it's not, that, that maybe there were some tipping points, something that happened that really pushed someone that breakup, the not getting into the school they wanted, the, you know, the bullying, or some event might be the precipitant, but there's almost always, if you really dig down, a whole bunch of other stuff that's come together that's increased their vulnerability to begin with. My name's John Roderick. I lost my son, Shane, 17 years old, to suicide about a year ago. He was a senior. My family was shattered that day when we found out that he died. Basically, we're picking up the pieces right now, and some of the pieces are missing. Shane was a happy-go-lucky kid. If you saw pictures of Shane when he was a young boy, you would have never thought that this was gonna be the, the story of my family. He had so much life to him. I do think that I missed some signs. About two years before that, I remember teachers saying to me, uh, parent-teachers, that he had never seen the kid smile, and now I think back to that day a lot. That was something I should have probably taken more serious. I just, I just missed it. He was a lot like me, so I thought a lot of, I thought a lot of it was natural. Maybe a year before he died, he actually was pretty good and picked up music. He stopped playing sports, started playing music, and the week before he died, he went to Italy. He had a great time. He met a lot of friends that got to see the real side of him that didn't know him, and then he returned from Italy on a Friday, and on, on Monday morning, he had died. The days afterwards, it was almost like your body released chemicals that you were just in total shock. My wife and my two daughters would sit on the couch watching TV. Normally he would be at his computer, which is in the living room where we would all sit, and he was just missing. And I can tell you that the text messages and the phone calls and the people sending mails and just the compassion and love from family, friends, co-workers, I, I mean, that enabled us to get out of bed and eventually go to school and go to work and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the love that people showed us and that's what enabled us to, to realize that we had to go on. The months afterwards, you know, were very difficult. It's still difficult, but a lot of people um, have supported us and that's, 
that's what's helped us put one foot in front of the other. As you just heard, youth suicide is complicated and there are many risk factors, warning signs, and protective factors that you should be aware of. The following school-based scenarios highlight issues that may increase the risk for suicide among young people. Together, these scenarios will provide opportunities to develop your skills on how to identify and respond to a young person who may be at risk for suicide. Edgar is in fourth grade and is much taller and heavier than most of his peers. However, because he has a tremendous sense of humor, he is very well liked and very popular amongst his classmates. One day during recess, during a game of dodgeball, Edgar trips on the ball and falls down. Stephen, a fifth grader, yells, look at the beach whale on the playground. And Stephen and the other fifth graders with him laugh. Edgar turns red, but he picks himself up and he starts to get ready to play again. Several of Edgar's friends though, they get angry and they tell Stephen and his friends to shut up. A shouting match ensues until the teacher comes over to break it up. Ever since I came back to school after trying to end my life, I just haven't been myself. My family, my counselor, my girlfriend are great. They're very supportive. I'm just not myself. I don't know why I'm not happy. It's just hard for me to stay focused. All the people are here cheering for me. They are happy for me. I don't even know what's wrong. I have so much to be excited about. Nobody hears me. Nobody hears me. I'm dying inside. Are you okay? I can't think the way I used to. I'm not focused. You were all over the place out there today. You're one of my leaders, but you were a little out of control. You definitely weren't yourself. Talk to me. I was to try to kill myself. Sometimes I just feel like... Look, if I'm a team, I understand. Carter, you know me better than that. I like you. You're a good kid. Maybe, I don't know what you're going through, but we should probably go talk to the counselor and come up with a plan. If you say so, I trust you, Coach. Coach and Miss J are cool. The whole time that I thought I was hiding what I was going through and worrying all the time about who knew, they saw right through me. I still don't feel great every day. And even though I have a shrink, I can use all the help I can get. I don't have to hold it in anymore. I just need to ask. I still think about killing myself. I'm afraid if I tell anybody about these feelings, I'll be back in the hospital. The Royal Road to Treating Self-Injury is to teach people new, healthy ways to regulate their emotions. Common examples of emotion regulation skills, or replacement skills as they're also called, are learning mindful breathing techniques that lower your heart rate, your respiration rate, and your blood pressure. Other examples are doing vigorous exercise 
that brings down urges to self-injure. And other examples include visualization, such as imagining a peaceful scene that brings down your level of distress. Individuals, all individuals, respond based on how they respond to trauma. So it's going to be different for any two people or any three people. Some people live with trauma every day and do just fine. Other people live with trauma and then there's one particular trauma that just sends them over the edge. Then there are other people who don't have necessarily a lot of overt trauma, um, but aren't able to handle any trauma per se at all and would have a great deal of difficulty. So it's an individual equation. Different people respond very differently to trauma, although we all, again, have trauma. And stress is in all trauma. Uh, so uh, a lot of this is how do we respond to stress, and then how do we manage and how do we cope beyond that. As an educator, administrator, and parent, Roger Bourgeois knows all too well the importance of providing a welcoming, accepting, and supportive learning environment for all of his students. And he was particularly grateful when his son Mark was treated in this manner when he returned to school following a suicide attempt. Mark's situation, after being you know, bullied for many years, his sophomore year in high school, it just kind of culminated into a very, very, very deep depression. Mark was depressed for six months. And during that six month depression is when he no longer felt that he had a future. He no longer felt that he wanted to live. It was so difficult to look at a, a child that was just such a a warm, compassionate young man, and to see him see no hope for his future. Um, today, he's doing fantastic. He's an RN, uh, summa cum laude from, from Suffolk University. Um, once he got through the depression, uh, and he got into an environment where, where he felt accepted and supported, um, and he realized that his family uh, and his true friends loved him unconditionally, um, he was fine, but uh, getting him through school, and especially through high school, was difficult. As a parent with a, a, a depressed, suicidal sophomore, I was the first one up every day. So when I got up every morning, the first thing that I would do was go into Mark's room. And every morning for six months, until he came out of that depression, I went into that bedroom to see if he was breathing not knowing whether he would be. The second thing I'd like to share with you is from Mark's perspective. We had an incident one night that I think really gave a lot of insight into what, what he was feeling. My wife and I came home from work and he was sitting at the kitchen table waiting for us. He was exceptionally calm. His demeanor was, was just so relaxed and he wanted to talk to us and he basically began the conversation trying to explain to us that we would be better off if he was dead and that I think he was looking for us to give him permission to commit suicide and he kept saying to us mom dad you don't understand I'm, I'm broken and I can't be fixed we pleaded with him we said Mark you're, you're gonna be okay you're depressed you know, we're going to get you some help. You're going to go into therapy. You're going to possibly go on medication, but you're going to be okay. He said, Dad, you don't understand. I'm broken. I can't be. I said, No, Mark, you don't understand. You're going to be okay. You just have to bear with this. You have to stick this out. You have to, you have to work with us on this. And he said, Dad, he said, I'm broken. I can't be fixed. He got up from the kitchen table. He walked in the living room. He took the lampshade off the lamp and he unscrewed the light bulb, came back to the table and he grabbed the light bulb in his hand and he, he crushed it, cut in his hand, there was blood streaming and he looked at me and he said, Dad, the light bulb's broken, can you fix that light bulb?
Mark's situation, after being, you know, bullied for many years, his sophomore year in high school, it just kind of culminated into a very, very, very deep depression. And he basically began the conversation trying to explain to us that we would be better off if he was dead. I think he was looking for us to give him permission to commit suicide. He kept saying to us, Mom, Dad, you don't understand. I'm, I'm broken and I can't be fixed. So after Mark's attempted suicide, he was hospitalized, and he was hospitalized in a psychiatric unit, and he couldn't have any visitors except for his immediate family. And we could only visit from six o'clock to eight o'clock each evening. So the day after this happened, I got a phone call from the vice principal at his school. And the word had, had spread through the school what had happened, and he wanted to tell me how sorry he was and if there was anything that the school could do to let, let him know. But the real reason for his call was because three of the teachers that Mark had at the school who were pretty shaken up by this wanted to see Mark. They wanted to visit him in the hospital. And they called the hospital and the hospital explained to them that he couldn't have any visitors and that the only exception to that, except for immediate family, was if the family gave permission for the person to visit and gave up some of those two hours of their visiting time uh, to the other, other person. So he was calling to ask permission if we would give permission to those three teachers to go in and visit with Mark, and we did. Those teachers, we gave them each 15 minutes. So we went in for an hour and 15 minutes after them. They went in before us for 15 minutes each, and they visited with Mark. And the difference that that made for them to go out of their way, for them to go above it, way above and beyond the call of being an educator, to try and help a student who saw no hope for living, really. Um, and even more importantly, after Mark got out of the hospital and was back in school, those three teachers were, were I, I described them as his guardian angels. They watched over him every day. They kept an eye on him. We would get a phone call if there was a bad day, if Mark was having a bad day, keep an extra special eye on him tonight. Today didn't go so well. I don't know how this would have turned out if it wasn't for those three teachers. I don't know if we would have saved Mark without their help. As Desmond Tutu once said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. The pathway to healing and hope for suicide loss survivors and suicide attempt survivors is a difficult and complex journey. The following stories capture the light and the strength that were found in the darkest moments. As part of my journey through grief, I met other survivors of suicide, and I finally found people who knew what I was going through. As I listened to their stories, it normalized everything I was feeling, the anger, the helplessness, and the guilt. Even not knowing all the facts that surrounded by my brother's death wasn't an uncommon thing to experience. I felt better to know that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't the only one who had managed to survive the unimaginable. I've learned so much about suicide, depression, and the isolation that comes along with it. I miss Michael every day, but I strive to have a life that has meaning so I can make a difference in others' lives the way others have done for me. Grief after suicide is a difficult road to walk, but it's a little bit easier when you have someone to walk beside you.
Karen saw many mental health professionals during the time she suffered with bulimia, depression, and anxiety. And they and Karen worked very hard at her recovery. I'm convinced that that bought us additional time, perhaps years with Karen. And while I'll always love and miss Karen, I'll always be grateful for every day of her life. Life is a gift. Each day is a gift. My life is coming together so wonderful like that. I never thought I was going to graduate. Um, I started college my senior year of high school so I could just move out and not go to school. And that was 2008 and I'm finally getting it. And it's such a wonderful feeling inside. There's just so many people that support me. Obviously Heather, my godson, uh, my family. Things are going really well with them. I have a boyfriend now, and if that was ever going to happen again. And I want to work on an inpatient psych unit for kids and adolescents. <laughs> and hopefully help me's, little me's, every day. I'm just, once again, even further. And so I sort of become a little mantra in my mind. Once again, I'm like, okay, I can do this. I've done it before. I'll do it again. Young people struggling with suicidality often carry labels of stigma, shame, and guilt. These labels hide the strength and beauty of who they are. They are strong and resilient. The way that I would label would be survivor, overcomer, extraordinary. Because if you begin to think about the circumstances that many of these individuals come through, uh, very few people can get through those situations unscathed, but yet they make it through. Knowing how to talk about youth suicide, intervening when a young person is suicidal, and helping a school after they've experienced suicide loss or serious attempts by young people can save lives. Yet no one person, parent, teacher, counselor, administrator, mentor, can implement suicide prevention efforts on their own. Suicide prevention is everyone's business. And with this training, we hope to get that much closer to creating a world where everyone knows how to prevent youth suicide.